everyone. My name is Henry Lombard. I'm your host for this podcast episode series for Advanced Planning Thought, ARPL 4014, a YouTube podcast assignment brought to you by Mobile Malaza from the Witt School of Architecture and Planning in Johannesburg. Today on the show, we have a special guest and fellow Witt's graduate whose family resides in Ishowe, KwaZulu-Natal. Joining us online to give us some insight into the experience around current events in the KwaZulu-Natal civil unrest that has been affecting communities and families in hotspots such as Mshlanga, Ulundi, Ishowe, Peter Maritzburg, Pinetown, amongst many others. Welcome, Kuhle Konke. It's great to have you online for this chat. Um, yeah, how are you doing? Um, hi, hey Marie. I'm so glad that I was able to be a part of your podcast. And yeah, I'm very excited to just bring some insight on the situation that's been happening across yeah. KZN. Um, I'm good. I'm good. Um, it's been a roller coaster um, experience for like the past two weeks, but all in all, I'm good. I'm I'm excited to be here. Well, that's good. You're looking well, so and at least you're safe. So I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> that's true. Now, Kukle, you've seen some some major challenges being experienced in the past week by residents in Kezidin and Gauteng around food shortages and fuel shortages. You've been in Johannesburg for, during the past week for, um, with the civil unrest. Um, but your family's obviously been caught up amidst all the chaos. So I'm sure you and your loved ones have been in contact um, every day, um, just, you know, constant communication to see what's happening and if they're safe or not. Um, and, yeah, we, let's let's get into the challenges they've been experiencing, challenges you've been experiencing. You know, this is a topic that deals with difficult times. So, um, yeah, let's start unpacking that by some of my questions that I've got for you. Not a problem. Cool. So, great. Let's get started. Um, which suburb in Ishawe is your family cur currently living in? So, they live in a suburb called Sunnydale. Um, it's pretty, it's not in town. It's fairly close to town, but it's also really next to the township. So, like, in between, yeah, the town and the township. Um, so, that's basically where... They're currently residing. Oh, hectic. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> did they experience any kind of? Um, did they were they involved in any of the? Um, did they feel safe on it at any point? Um, unsafe? Did they experience direct threats? Yeah. Really. So, for like where our like our neighborhood is, because it it was like used as a bypass by a lot of people that were like looting in town okay. and then they'll bypass our neighborhood to get to like the township so for them it like they basically just saw everything like happen right in front of them people just passing by whether it was cars whether, whether it was people um and I could say like from just from talking to them they didn't feel safe because like we had we heard a lot of stories where looters would actually take whatever they took and actually ask residents, can I use your house as um a place to store my my things? And some instances people would actually use guns to threaten um residents. Um so for them, they were always in the house, always kept the the gate locked because they didn't want to let anyone into, you know, the home. It was, they didn't receive any direct threats, but they just didn't feel safe and hearing from what other people experienced. Yeah, it was, it was a lot. Sure. That sounds really hectic. And yeah. I'm glad they got through the, that week. That must have been hectic. So, wow. Um, anyone else in the community, did they experience um, engagement with looters and rioters, any violence? Um, was it in the general area around where they were saying that they that they experienced this kind of like a thoroughfare, like you were saying, they were passing through and hoping people could store their, their goods for them? Sure, that's, that's, that's quite hectic. Yeah, it was really hectic. Sure. 
In the subsequent days to the rioting and looting, what were the most immediate challenges they experienced in the area? Was it security, you know, supplies, food? What kind of challenges were they experiencing then? I would say it was, we definitely haven't ha- experienced any like food insecurity of any sort. Um, but we have been having a lot of challenges um, concerned with security. Okay. Um, yeah, as especially this, like the past two years with this whole pandemic, um, there's just been a lot going on. And I don't know if it's because people see it as an opportunity that um, there's like a lot of people that are in their homes or whether they're unemployed and they're using this as an opportunity to, um, you know, engage in crime. But there's been a scary amount of like, like of crimes that have been going on in this town. Um, yeah, like just the, I think it was two weeks back, we actually saw, like my parents actually saw um, someone attempt to um, rob our next door neighbors through the window. Oh my word. And yeah, it was, it was a lot. And yeah, there's just been a very, yeah, a sense of just everyone being unsafe and on their toes um yeah yeah, there's just yeah in terms of security yeah a lot of people just seem unsafe okay yeah that's I, I guess that's understandable you know these issues get compounded over the last year you've had unemployment rise um crime rise um yeah being stuck at home like you said and then, um, you know, the lockdowns is restricting people's businesses. It's it's just yeah. these. This is going to erupt at some point. So it looks like everything is 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 connected and linked in in such a way that that at some point we're going to have to deal with with um, yeah major crime issues like that, and people will feel yes. unsafe. So sure. Um, how did the last week leave you and your family feeling psychologically, emotionally? <laughs> yeah, oh my uh, I don't I don't know how to explain. Uh it's just it was it was a lot. It it was almost as if we were living in a movie. I see. It, it, yeah, it it was it was so real, but at the same time, I don't know if it was like because we were just in so much panic and shock. Yeah. We also kind of told ourselves that it, it wasn't real. Yeah. And just having other family members also like my brother is my brothers are they live in the C B um Durban C B D. So for them, we'd like call them every day, like, are you guys safe? Please stay inside. Cause like on the news you'd see like your know, Durban Durban experienced a lot and on fire, like literally. Yes, literally on fire. Um, and they would see everything happening like right in front of them. They would just look outside and like everything was just happening for them. And it was just like, yeah, it was just that stress. Like, are you guys okay? And if you're not okay, do you guys have food? And, you know, it was just, yeah, it was just a lot. And also just our friends like here in the town, like they'd ask like for bread and you, you'd also be like, I don't have myself, you know, and there's nothing we could do. It was just a lot. Like it was just emotionally, mentally, physically draining. Like it was just hard to concentrate and yeah, it was, yeah, it was a lot. It took a toll on us. Yeah. Shame, man. So um, it's been quite stressful for your family, it seems. Um, how did you deal with things? Did, did you, you know, did you engage with, um, did you try and switch off? Did you k- kind of like have to take some breaks um, from media, from the news, things like that? Yeah, oh, def- like the news, like for the first few days when everything was happening, the only thing we did was watch the news. And I remember just saying, you know what? Let's just switch everything. Like everyone, let's just take a break. Let's 
try focus on like channel our focus on something else other than what's happening around the world because just watching the news was just so depressing and even if you go on social media twitter instagram everyone's posting about it on whatsapp everyone's posting about it it was just a lot and it was so triggering yeah that that the break was really necessary. It was something that we needed just to switch off everything and just find something else to focus on, whether it was jogging or baking. Yeah, refresh your mind in a way. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, we definitely did that. In what ways did your family um family's community help or in some cases prevent help um during an in the during the days um and after the riots and looting? Yeah. During the days, there was not much. Okay, towards the end of the riots, um, a lot of community members did decide to um, block roads and protect their stores um, because, yeah, it was getting out of control and everyone was just like, you know what, let's stand up. Because, like, we're such a small town and we didn't have a lot of reinforcements. Like, yeah, there were only a few police officers, like about, I could say like 30 that were actually trying to take control of the situation. And with the amount of people that were looting, it was just not enough. And we just, as a community, we got like messages on like the WhatsApp group on, guys, let's take a stand. Let's protect what we have left. And, you know, People actually went out and did that. They protected their stores. They blocked off roads so that they couldn't access our town anymore. Sure. And yeah, and afterwards, I would say like even now, people we like trucks will come by giving you food, you know, whether it's bread or handing out water, whatever they have or whatever that was left of their stores, people have taken the initiative to give out what they can to help those that are really in need or could didn't get the opportunity to buy groceries because of what was happening because we're still like trying to rebuild. Yeah. And then so it's so massive yeah. out here. Trying yeah. to get food from like pick and pay, you have to stand in a five hour queue. So that's exactly yeah. Yeah. Did they have adequate food supply at home to potentially see them through a week plus of not accessing retail facilities um, for supplies, food, or even fuel? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> fuel was, yeah. They were out of fuel for like the whole week. We could only make like short trips, but yeah, there was no fuel at all. Really, sure. And yeah, the car, the cars here at home didn't have fuel at all. And when it came to food supply, luckily, um, my mom, I know she did the grocery just before, like everything started. Um, yeah. The day before, she managed to get a few things. So it wasn't that bad in terms of um, food supply, but definitely petrol. There was no petrol at all. Sure. Um, yeah. Hectic. What food did they rely on? So um, was it just basically that last grocery shopping that your mom did that they relied on for that week? Yeah, that's, yeah, that was literally all they could rely on because it was like, it was, it affected everyone to a point where you couldn't, like you were, you couldn't really ask like your neighbors or a friend for food because you'd also think you know they also need it mm. so it was just a matter of everyone relying on what they had um so they yeah they definitely were just relying on that grocery that my mom like bought the day before sure okay yeah what measures do you and your family plan to take um to mitigate any future um event like this happening where you don't have um accessibility to food or fuel or any kind of supplies yeah funny enough my mom was saying the other day she wants to um start a veggie garden okay yeah she was like no nope, after this at least if anything if this were to happen again at least would have something yes it mm -hmm. 
it won't be the same as going to a shop and getting food. But as long as you have something, you know, so she's she's looking into starting a veg, a vegetable garden. Okay, um, yeah, in terms of fuel, I mean, I've seen other people do this before, especially farmers where you'd come with like um, containers and fill that up with fuel okay. and store it. I think, I don't know if my parents are looking into doing that but I definitely would suggest it to them that just have something like have that one something. container yeah, yeah for standby for you know we never know what can happen so just be prepared for anything yeah that's that's yeah. quite wise sure so you yeah. said your, your mom is planning to do um to grow a plant a veggie garden um, yes. Are there are any other veggie gardens in the area that they have there um, that they may have accessibility to? Ex- um, most people here have like their like their veggie gardens like within their property. Okay. Um, so unless you <clears throat> like know someone that has a veggie garden, then you won't have access to it. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 There's no in like yeah. There's no public um, vegetable garden where okay. You know, so anyone private residents own their own small little veggie patch here and there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um. Do the residents in in their area keep livestock? Um. In public space or in private space or at all even? Yeah. Um. So here in town, like, what I've noticed is that a lot of people. If they do have livestock, it's only like chickens. Okay. Um, they won't be able to have like something like cows or you know. Uh, I think it's because just of to, in terms of space and maybe it's like the regulations of the town. But definitely, definitely further out in like the farm areas, you will find people that have um, cows and sheep, goats, you know. Okay. But yeah, here in town, it's very limited in what you can have right yeah that's understandable obviously space confinement of space regulations bylaws and yeah. um, things like that that really confine you to only keep certain amounts of chickens um maybe even goats maybe not goats pigs you know those are all options that that you have um to keep livestock but it's, it's difficult so i guess feeding the, the animals as well that's also a challenge so yeah yeah so um, where did your your family receive information from um, and updates around security, food supply and other supplies in the area um, in the last week? Was it, you know, word of mouth, community members, WhatsApp groups, you said, um, yeah. were the board councillors involved in disseminating information at all? Um, how did it work? Um, so then... Um, I heard that there's like a WhatsApp group where there are members of council um, that are within that group and the shop owners um, and then, yeah, the community members. So a lot of people um, got information through that WhatsApp group if you are part of it. If you weren't, then I also know, because we're such a small town and almost like everyone knows everyone, um, <laughs> so I know that phone calls were made. Did you hear about this? And, you know, then inform other people if you weren't in the WhatsApp group, but there were never like any like newsletters handed out or, you know, anything like that. I know for sure that if it wasn't the WhatsApp group, then you heard it from someone else. Oh, really? Okay. So all digital, um, telephonic communication basically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you aware of any NGO agencies or private corporations that are providing relief in the areas there um, and the surrounding communities? And if you do, uh, do you know some of the agencies um, and have they been successful at reaching out and providing relief to residents there? Um, so as far as I know, um, there isn't any like NGO or organization in our town I might be wrong but yeah as far as I know I haven't heard 
of yeah any of that okay um yeah but hopefully okay. one day it will happen <laughs> so pretty much the community helping the people in the community really okay well that's that, that, yeah. i mean rebuilding with from within it's it's great um could yeah. you, yeah. anything else you'd like to tell us on the past week's events how it's affected you your community and um, possibly your sentiments on food security um for the future in the country yeah um so what i can say is that and even like yeah i didn't think i would i, I mean i knew it was coming Mm. um just judging from what like with everything going on in our country and i knew like something like this was coming but i didn't expect it to be so soon um but i'm actually very um surprised but how our like our small town was able to rebuild so quickly and you know um they've done a great job yeah it's mm. the unity within our our town has just been amazing um how can we prevent something like something such as food insecurity in our country hmm <laughs> um yeah it's difficult it's difficult i feel like I I feel like a lot of investment needs to go within to like farms. Um, I don't think they get as much as support and it's not something that's really recognized by a lot of people when essentially it's something, it's a job that's like really important. Um, yeah, I, I feel like if, if government could try, I mean, we have so many unemployed people it would be nice if they could provide some training to those that are actually interested in farming and, you know, contributing um, to this food insecurity. And how do you go about um, giving them land and the equipment to do so? Yeah. Um, also feel like hmm, our government, <laughs> I love our government really has it's like if, if it's safe to say they really have failed us in like a lot of ways and this is one of them um and if it is possible to try and change our government structure to one that has our our best interests at heart and you know at serving us yeah that's that's another suggestion <laughs> from me um but yeah that's that's just my opinions you know that's some very interesting suggestions you've got there and i i wholeheartedly agree with you um there, it seems to be some sort of kind of gap between government intervention and you know the people being able to help themselves in, in terms of um yeah. self-sufficiency in terms of food um there's yeah. definitely the potential there from government side in terms of policy but it's it, there seems to be a delay on it actually being implemented, you know, that that's, yeah. And like you said, yeah. I mean, our government has failed us in this and, and who's paying the price, yeah. the people. So it's, yeah. yeah, sad. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. yeah. But I mean, governments all over the world are really actually quite incompetent and it's the people who hold them to account and, you know, criticize them and yeah. put them under pressure. And we have to constantly do that, I guess. So it's, it's a difficult yeah. task. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. But Kutle, yeah. thanks so much for your input today. It's really interesting to to see a um a different side of the story here and down in Ishawe and that your family's keeping well and the community there is 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 helping out and they're rebuilding. It's really great to hear that and it it inspires hope in in all of us really with after having That's dealt true. with such a an upheaval in the last last week. So yeah, good on them and um, send them all my regards. And yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they don't experience something like this anytime soon again. So thanks so much for your valuable insights. Um, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Um, 
yeah, I hope that the efforts to rebuild and clean up will leave residents in your area with a renewed sense of community, um, pride, and increased awareness around food security and future challenges around this topic. So thanks for joining and um, continue to stay safe and healthy. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I had an amazing time. Fantastic. Thanks. Keep well. Bye. All the best. Bye.